The Wall of Death by Victor Rousseau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wall of Death by Victor Rousseau. This news, said Cliff Hines, pointing to the newspaper, means the end of Homo Americanus. The newspaper in question was the hour sheet of the International Broadcast Association, just delivered by pneumatic tube at the laboratory. It was stamped 1961, month 13, day 7, horometer 3, and the headlines on the front page confirmed the news of the decisive defeat of the American military and naval forces at the hands of the Chinese Republic. A gallant fight for days against hopeless odds, failure of the army dynamos, airships cut off from ground guidance, battleships ripped to pieces by the Chinese disintegrators, and, finally, the great wave of black death that had wiped out 200,000 men. K. Bevan, to use the old-fashioned names which still persisted despite the official numerical nomenclature, glanced through the account. He threw the sheet away. "'We deserved it, Cliff,' he said. Cliff nodded. "'You saw that bit about the new Chinese disintegrator? If the government had seriously considered our crumbler—' Kay glanced at the huge, humming top that filled the center of the laboratory. It spun so fast that it appeared as nothing but a spherical shadow, through which one could see the sparse furnishings, the table, the apparatus ranged upon it, and the window overlooking the upper streets of New York. Yes, if, he answered bitterly. And I'm willing to bet the Chinese have an inferior machine, built upon the plans that Chinese servant stole from us last year. We deserved it, Cliff, said Kay again. For ten years we've harried and enslaved the yellow man, and taken a hundred thousand of his men and women to sacrifice to the earth giants. What would we have done if conditions had been reversed? Self-preservation, Cliff suggested. Exactly. The law of the survival of the fittest. They thought that they were fitter to survive. I tell you, they had right on their side, Cliff, and that's what's beaten us. Now a hundred thousand of our own boys and girls must be fed into the maw of these monsters every year. God! Suppose it were Ruth! Or you are, said Cliff. If only we could perfect the crumbler. What use would that be against the earth giants? There's nothing organic about them, not even bones. Pure protoplasm. We could have used it against the Chinese, said Cliff. Now he shrugged his shoulders hopelessly. And if explorers had been content to leave the vast unknown Antarctic continent alone, they would never have taught the imprisoned giants to cross the great ice barrier. But that crossing had taken place fifteen years ago, and already the mind of man had become accustomed to the grim facts. Who could have dreamed that the supposed table-land was merely a rim of ice mountains, surrounding a valley twice the size of Europe, so far below sea level that it was warmed to tropic heat by earth's interior fires or that this valley was peopled with what could best be described as organized protoplasm enormous half-transparent gelatinous organism attaining a height of about a hundred feet and crudely organized into forms not unlike those of men Half the members of the Rawlins expedition which had first entered this valley had fallen victims to the monsters. Most of the rest had gone raving mad, and the stories of the two who returned, sane, to Buenos Aires, were discredited and scoffed at as those of madmen. But of a second expedition none had survived, and it was the solitary survivor of the third who had confirmed the amazing story. The giant monsters, actuated by some flickering human intelligence, had found their way out of the central valley, where they had subsisted by enfolding their vegetable and small animal prey with pseudopods, that is to say temporary projections of arms from the gelatinous bulk of their substance. 
They had floated across the shallow seas between the tip of the Antarctic continent and Cape Horn, as toy balloons float on water. Then they had spread northward, extending in a wall that reached from the Atlantic to the Andes. And as they moved, they had devoured all vegetables and animal life in their path. Behind them lay one great, bare, absolutely lifeless area. How many of them were there? That was the hideous fact that had to be faced. Their numbers could not be counted, because after attaining a height of about a hundred feet, they reproduced by budding. And within a few weeks these buds, in turn, attained their full development. The Argentine government had sent a force of twenty thousand men against them, armed with cannon, machine guns, tanks, airplanes, poison gas, and the new death ray. And in the night, when it was bivouacking, after what it had thought was glorious victory, it had been overwhelmed and eaten. Proof against the poison gas the hideous monsters were, and invulnerable to shot and shell. Divided and subdivided, slashed into ribbons, blown to fragments by bombs, each of the pieces simply became the nucleus of a new organism, able within a few hours to assume the outlines of a dwarf man, and to seize and devour its prey. But the Argentine expedition had done worse than it at first dreamed of. It had given the monsters a taste for human flesh. After that the wave of devastation had obliterated life in every city clear up to the Amazonian forests, and then it had been discovered that by feeding these devils human flesh they could be rendered torpid and their advance stayed, so long as the periodical meals continued. At first criminals had been supplied them, then natives, then Chinese, obtained by periodical war raids. What would you have? The savage regions of the earth had already been depopulated, and a frenzy of fear had taken possession of the whole world. Now the Chinese had defeated the annual American invasion, and the earth giants were budding and swarming through the heart of Brazil. A man, said the theosophist, is the fifth of the great root races that have inhabited this planet. The fourth were the Atlanteans. The third were the Lemurians, half-human beings of whom the Australian aborigines are the survivors. The second race was not fully organized into human form. Of the first, nothing is known. These are the second race, surviving in the Antarctic valleys. Half-human objects, groping toward that perfection of humanity, of which we ourselves fall very far short. As the Kabbalah says, man, before Adam, reached from heaven to earth. K. Bevan and Cliff Hines had been working feverishly to perfect their crumbler for use in the Chinese wars. Convinced, as were all fair-minded men, that these annual raids were unjustified, they yielded to the logic of the facts. Should America sacrifice a hundred thousand of her boys and girls each year when human life was cheap in China? Boys and girls! It had been discovered that the earth giants required the flesh of women as well as of men. Some subtle chemical constituent then produced the state of torpidity during which the advance and the budding of the monsters was stayed. During the ten past years their northward advance had been almost inappreciable. Brazil had even sent another army against them. But the deadliest gases had failed to destroy the tenacious life of these protoplasmic creatures, and the tanks which had driven through and through them had become entangled and blocked in their gelatinous exudations, and the occupants eaten. All over the world scientists were striving to invent some way of removing this menace to the world. Moreover, airplanes sent to the polar continent had reported fresh masses mobilizing for the advance northward. A second wave would probably burst through the Amazon forest barrier and sweep over the isthmus and overrun North America. Five days after the news of the Chinese disaster was confirmed, Cliff Hines came back from the capital of the American Confederation, Washington. 
"'It's no use, Kate,' he said. "'The government won't even look at the crumbler. "'I told them it would disintegrate every inorganic substance to powder, "'and they laughed at me. "'And it's true, Kay. "'They've given up the attempt to enslave China. "'Henceforth a hundred thousand of our own citizens "'are to be sacrificed each year. "'Eaten alive, Kay? Good! "'If only the crumbler would destroy organic forms as well!' The first year's quota of 50,000 boys and 50,000 girls, thrown to the maw of the monsters to save humanity, nearly disrupted the Confederation. Despite the utmost secrecy, despite the penalty of death for publishing news of the sacrifice, despite the fact that those who drew the fatal lots were snatched from their homes at dead of night, everything became known. On the vast pampas in the extreme north of the Argentine Republic, where Bolivia, the Argentine, Paraguay, and Brazil unite, was the place of sacrifice. Thousands of acres, white with the bones of those whom the monsters had engulfed, brainless, devoid of intelligence, sightless, because even the sense had not become differentiated in them. Yet by some infernal instinct the earth giants had become aware that this was their feasting ground. By some tacit compact, the guards who had annually brought their victims to be devoured had been unmolested. The vast wall of semi-human shapes withdrawing into the shelter of the surrounding forest while the Chinese were staked out in rows. Death, which would have been a mercy, had been denied them. It was living flesh that the earth giants craved. And here, on the spot known as Golgotha, the hideous sacrifice had been annually repeated. The first year, when the chosen victims were transported to the fatal spot, all America went mad. Frenzied parents attacked the offices of the Federation in every city. The cry was raised that Spanish Americans had been selected in preference to those of more northern blood. Civil war loomed imminent. And year after year these scenes must be repeated. Boys and girls from fifteen to twenty years of age, the flower of the Federation, a hundred thousand of them must die a hideous death to save humanity. Now the choice of the second year's victims was at hand. In their laboratory, removed to the heart of the Adirondacks wilderness, Cliff and Kay were working frantically. "'It's the last chance, Kay,' said Cliff. If I've not solved the secret this time, it means another year's delay. The secret of dissolving organic forms as well as inorganic ones. What is this mysterious power that enables organic forms to withstand the terrific bombardment of the W ray? The W ray was the Millikan cosmic ray, imprisoned and adapted for human use. It was a million times more powerful than the highest known voltage of electricity. Beneath it, even the diamond, the hardest substance known, dissolved into a puff of dust, and yet the most fragile plant growth remained unaffected. The laboratory in the Adirondacks was open at one end. Here, against a background of big forest trees, a curious medley of substances had been assembled. Old chairs, a couple of broken-down airplanes, a large disused dynamo, a heap of discarded clothing, a miscellany of kitchen utensils on a table, a gas stove, and a heap of metal junk of all kinds. The place looked, in fact, like a junk heap. The great top was set in a socket in a heavy bar of craolite, the new metal that combined the utmost tensile strength with complete infusibility, even in the electric furnace. About six feet in height, it looked like nothing but what it was, a gyroscope in gimbals, with a long and extremely narrow slit extending all around the central bulge, but closed on the operator's side by a sliding cover of the same craolite. Within this top, which by its motion generated a field of electrical force between the arms of an interior magnet, the W rays were generated in accordance with a secret formula. The speed of gyration, exceeding anything known on Earth, multiplied their force a billion-fold, converting them to wavelengths shorter than the shortest known to physical science. Like all great inventions, the top was of the simplest construction. "'Well,' said Cliff, "'you'd better bring out Susie.' Kay left the laboratory and went to the cabin beside the lake that the two men occupied. 
From her box in front of the stove, a lady porcupine looked up lazily and grunted. Kay raised the porcupine. In the box, of course. Susie was constitutionally indolent, but one does not handle porcupines, however smooth their quills may lie. Kay brought her to the heap of junk and placed the box on top of it. He went inside the laboratory. "'I may as well tell you, Cliff, I wouldn't have brought Susie if I thought the experiment had the least chance of success,' he said. Cliff said nothing. He was bending over the wheel, adjusting a micrometer. "'All ready, Kay?' he asked. Kay nodded and stepped back. He swallowed hard. He hated sacrificing Susie to the cause of science. He almost hoped the experiment would fail. Cliff pressed a lever, and slowly the ponderous top began to revolve upon its axis. Faster, faster, till it was nothing but a blur, faster yet until only its outlines were visible. Cliff pressed a lever on the other side. Nothing happened, apparently, except for a cloudy appearance of the air at the open end of the laboratory. Cliff touched a foot lever. The top began to grow visible. Its rotations could be seen. It ran slower, began to come to a stop. The cloud was gone. Where the airplanes and other junk had been was nothing but a heap of grayish dust. It was this that had made the cloud. Nothing remained except the impalpable powder against the background of the trees. Kay caught Cliff's arm. Look out, he shouted, pointing to the heap. Something's moving in there. Something was. A very angry lady porcupine was scrambling out, a quillless porcupine with a white skin looking like nothing so much as a large hairless rat. Cliff turned to Kay. We've failed, he said briefly. Too late for this year now. But the quills. Inorganic material. But even the bones remain intact because there's circulation in the marrow, you see. And the earth giants haven't even bones. They're safe this year. He flung himself down under a tree, staring up at the sky in abject despair. Look, Kay, I've got my number. Ruth Mead smiled as she handed Kay the ticket issued by the government announcing the lottery number provided for each citizen. One hundred thousand young people between the ages of fifteen and twenty would be drawn for the sacrifice, and Ruth, being nineteen, had come within the limits, but this would be her last year. In a few weeks the government would announce the numbers, drawn by a second lottery, of those who were condemned. Then, before these had been made public, the victims would already have been seized and hurried to the airship depots in a hundred places for conveyance to the hideous Golgotha of the Pampas. The chance that any individual would be among the fated ones was reasonably small. It was the fashion to make a jest of the whole business. Ruth smiled as she showed her ticket. Kay stared at it. Ruth, if... If anything happened to you, I'd go insane. I... I... Why this sudden ardor, Kay? Kay took Ruth's small hand in his. Ruth, you mustn't play with me any more. You know I love you. And the sight of that thing makes me almost insane. You do care, don't you? And as Ruth remained silent, Ruth, it isn't Cliff Himes, is it? I know you two are old friends. I'd rather it were Cliff than anybody else, if it has to be someone. But tell me, Ruth. It isn't Cliff, said Ruth slowly. Is it someone else? It's you, dear, answered Ruth. It's always been you. It might have been Cliff if you hadn't come along. But he knows now it can never be he. "'Does he know it's me?' asked Kay, greatly relieved. Ruth inclined her head. "'He took it very finely,' she said. "'He said just what you've said about him. "'Oh, Kay, if only your experiment had succeeded "'then the world could be free of this nightmare. "'What happened? "'Why couldn't you and Cliff make it destroy life?' "'I don't know, dear,' answered Kay. Iron and steel melt into powder at the least impact of the rays. 
they are so powerful that there was even a leakage through the rubber and an electron container. Even the craolite socket was partly fused, and that is supposed to be an impossibility. And there was a hole in the ground seven feet deep where the very mineral water in the earth had been dissolved. But against organic substances, the W ray is powerless. Next year, dear, next year, we'll have solved our problem, and then we'll free the world of this menace, this nightmare. Ruth, don't let's talk about that now. I love you. They kissed. The earth giants faded out of their consciousness even while Ruth held that ominous ticket in her hand. Kay said nothing to Cliff about it, but Cliff knew. Perhaps he had put his fate to the test with Ruth and learned the truth from her. Ruth made no reference to the matter when she saw Kay, but between the two men, friends for years, a coolness was inexorably developing. They had gone to work on the new machine. They were hopeful. When they were working, they forgot their rivalry. You see, Kay, said Cliff, we mustn't forget that the Millican rays have been bombarding Earth since Earth became a planet, out of the depths of space. It is their very nature not to injure organic life, otherwise all life on Earth would have been destroyed long ago. Now our process is only an adaptation of those cosmic rays. We haven't changed their nature. No, agreed Kay. What we want is a death ray strong enough to obliterate these monsters without simply disintegrating them and creating new fragments to bud into the complete being. Why do you suppose they are so tenacious of life, Cliff? They represent primeval man, life itself, striving to organize itself, and nothing is more tenacious than the life principle, answered Cliff. Meanwhile, the fatal weeks were passing. A few days after the tickets had been distributed, a government notice was broadcasted and published, ordaining that, in view of former dissensions, no substitutes for the condemned persons would be permitted. Rich or poor, each of the victims chosen by lot must meet his fate. And the monsters were growing active. There had been an extension of their activities. Tongues had been creeping up the rivers that ran into the Amazon. Suddenly a dense mass of the devils had appeared on the north coast near Georgetown. They had overleaped the Amazon. They were overrunning British Guiana, eating up everything on their way. Georgetown was abandoned. The monsters were in complete control. They will be cut off from the main herd, the optimistic reports announced. We shall deal with the main herd first. This year the sacrifice will have to be made, but it will be the last. Scientists have at last hit upon an infallible toxin which will utterly destroy this menace within a few months. Nobody believed that story, for everything had been tried and failed. In their laboratory, Cliff and Kay were working frantically, and now the coldness that had developed between them was affecting their collaboration, too. Cliff was keeping something back from Kay. Kay knew it. Cliff had made some discovery that he was not sharing with his partner. Often Kay, entering the laboratory, would find Cliff furtively attempting to conceal some operation that he was in the midst of. Kay said nothing, but a brooding anger began to fill his heart. So Cliff was trying to get all the credit for the result of their years of work together. And always, in the back of his mind, there was a vision of the little government ticket in Root's hand with the numbers in staring black type. They had burned into his brain. He could never forget them. Often at night, after a hard day's work, he would suddenly awaken out of a hideous nightmare in which he saw Ruth taken away by the agents of the government to be thrown as a sacrifice to the monsters. And Cliff was hiding something. That made the situation unbearable. The coolness between the two men was rapidly changing into open animosity. And then one day, quite by chance, in Cliff's absence, Kay came upon evidence of Cliff's activities. Cliff was no longer experimenting with the W-ray. He was using a new type of ray altogether, the next series, 
the senium electron emanation discovered only a few years before, which had the peculiar property of non-alternation, even when the senium electron changed its orbit around the central nucleus of the senium atom. Instead of discontinuity, the senium electron had been found to emit radiation steadily, and this had upset the classic theories of matter for the ninth time in the past fifteen years. And Kay's wrath broke loose in a storm of reproaches when Cliff came into the laboratory. "'You've been deliberately keeping me in the dark!' he shouted. "'You're a nice sort of partner to have. Here's where we split up the combination, Hines!' "'I've been thinking that for a long time,' sneered Cliff. "'Fact is, Kay, you're a little too elementary in your ideas to suit me. "'It's due to you that I kept hammering away on the wrong tack for years. "'The sooner we part, the better.' "'No time like now,' said Kay. "'Keep your laboratory. "'You put most of the money into it anyway. "'I'll build me another where I can work without being hampered "'by a partner who's out for himself all the time. "'Good luck to you in your researches, and I hope you'll get all the credit "'when you find a way of annihilating the Earth Giants.' "'And he stormed out of the laboratory, "'jumped into his plane, and winged his way southward "'toward his apartment in New York. "'Crowds in the streets of every town on the way, "'in villages and hamlets swarming like ants "'and hurrying along the highways. "'Kay, who flew one of the slow old-fashioned planes, averaging little more than a hundred miles an hour, winged his way methodically overhead, too much absorbed in his anger against Cliff to pay much attention to this phenomenon at first. But gradually it was borne in upon him that something was wrong. He flew lower, and now he was passing over a substantial town, and he could hear the shouts of anger that came up to him. The whole town was in a ferment, gathered in the town square. Suddenly the reason came home to Kay. He saw the adjoining airport and dropped like a plummet, hovering down until his wheels touched the ground. Without waiting to taxi into one of the public hangars, he leaped out and ran through the deserted grounds into the square. Groans, yells, shrieks of derision rent the air. The whole crowd had gone maniacal, and it was as Kay had thought, upon a white background high up on the town hall building. The numbers of the local boys and girls who had been picked for sacrifices were being shown. Eight boys and fifteen girls, already on their way into the wastes of South America to meet a hideous death. "'They took my Sally!' screamed a weazened woman, the tears raining down her cheeks. "'Kidnapped her at the street corner after dark! I didn't know! I didn't know why she had come home last night! Oh, God! My Sally, my little girl! Gone! Gone!' "'People, you must be patient,' boomed the government announcer. "'The President feels with you in your affliction.' but by next year a means will have been devised to destroying these monsters. Your children will have their sacrifice recorded in the Hall of Fame. They are true soldiers who— To hell with the government, roared a man. Stop that damn talk machine breaker, fellas. Then we'll hang President Bogart from the top of the Capitol. Yells answered him, and the crowd surged forward toward the building. "'Stand back!' shrieked the announcer. "'It's death to set foot on the step. "'We are now electrified. "'Last warning!' "'The first ranks of the mob recoiled "'as a charge of electricity at a voltage "'just short of that required to take life "'coursed through their bodies. "'Shrieks of agony rang out. "'Files of writhing forms covered the ground. "'Kay rushed to the automatic clerk "'at the window beside the metal steps, "'taking care to avoid contact with them. Within six feet, the temperature of his body brought the thermostatic control into action. The window slid upward, and the dummy appeared. He turned the dial to Albany. "'I want New York Division, Substation F, Loyalist Registration,' he called. "'Give me Z numbers of the lottery, please. "'No numbers will be given out until horometer one three. the dummy boomed. "'But I tell you, I must know immediately,' Kay pleaded frantically. "'Stand away, please. "'I've got to know, I tell you. "'We are now electrified. "'Last warning. "'Listen to me. "'My name's Kay Bevan. "'I—' "'A mighty buffet in the chest hurled Kay ten feet backward upon the ground. 
He rose, came within the electric zone, felt his arms twisted in a giant's grasp, staggered back again and sat down gasping. The window went down noiselessly, the dummy swung back into place. Kay got upon his feet again, choking with impotent rage. All about him men and women were milling in a frantic mob. He broke through them, went back to where his plane was standing. A minute later he was driving madly toward the district airport in New York, within three blocks of Ruth's apartment. He dropped into a vacant landing space, checked hastily, and rushed into the elevator. Once in the upper street he bounded to the middle platform, and, not satisfied to let it convey him at eight miles an hour, strode on through the indignant throng until he reached his destination. Hurling the crowds right and left, he gained the exit, and a half-minute later was on the upper level of the apartment block. He pushed past the janitor, and raced along the corridor to Ruth's apartment. She would be in, if all was well. She worked for the Broadcast Association, correcting the proofs that came from the district headquarters by pneumatic tube. He stopped outside the door. The little dial of white light showed him that the apartment was unoccupied. As he stood there in a daze, hoping against hope, he saw a thread hanging from the crevice between door and frame. He pulled at it, and drew out a tiny strip of scandium, the new compressible metal that had become fashionable for engagement rings. Plastic, all but invisible, it could be compressed to the thickness of a sheet of paper. It was the token of secret lovers, and Kay had given Ruth a ring of it. It was the signal, the dreaded signal that Ruth had been on the lottery list, the only signal that she had been able to convey, since stringent precautions were taken to prevent the victims becoming known until all possibility of rescue was removed. No chance of rescuing her. From a hundred airports the great government airships had long since sailed into the skies, carrying those selected by the wheel at Washington for sacrifice to the earth giants. Only one chance remained. If Cliff had discovered the secret that had so long eluded them, surely he would reveal it to him now. Their quarrel was forgotten. Kay only knew that the woman he loved was even then speeding southward to be thrown to the maw of the vile monsters that held the world in terror. Surely Cliff would bend every effort to save her. Only a few hours had passed since Kay had stormed out of the laboratory in the Adirondacks in a rage when he was back on their little private landing field. He leaped from the plane and ran up the trail beside the lake between the trees. The cabin was dark, and when Kay reached the laboratory he found it dark too. Cliff! Cliff! he shouted. No answer came, and with a sinking heart he snapped the button at the door. It failed to throw the expected flood of light through the interior. With shaking hand, Kay pulled the little electron torch from his pocket, and its bright beam showed that the door was padlocked. He moved round to the window. The glass was unbreakable, but the ray from the torch showed that the interior of the laboratory had been dismantled, and the great top was gone. In those few hours, Cliff for reasons best known to himself, had removed the top. Kay's one hope of saving Ruth, and he was gone. In that moment Kay went insane. He raved and cursed, calling down vengeance upon Cliff's head. Cliff's very motive was incredible. That he had deliberately removed the top in order that Ruth should die was not, of course, conceivable. But in that first outburst of fury Kay did not consider that. Presently... Kay's madness burned itself out. There was still one thing he could do. His plane, slow though it was, would carry him to the Pampas. He could get fresh fuel at numerous bootleg petrol stations, even though the regulations against intersectional flight were rigid. With luck he could reach the Pampas, perhaps before the sluggish monsters had fallen upon their prey. It was said that the victims sometimes waited for days. Something was rubbing against his leg, pricking it through his anklets. Kay looked down. A lady porcupine with tiny new quills was showing recognition, even affection, if such a spiny beast could be said to possess that quality. 
Somehow the presence of the beast restored Kay's mind to normal. "'Well, he's left us both in the lurch, Susie,' he said. "'Good luck to you, beastie, and may you find a secure hiding place until your quills have grown.' Drowning men catch at straws. Kay snatched out his watch, and the illuminated dial showed that it was already two quintets past horometer thirteen. He darted back to the cabin. The door was unfastened, and his torch showed him that, though Cliff had evidently departed and taken his things, the interior was much as it had been. When Kay picked up the telephotophone, the oblong dial flashed out. The instrument was in working order. He turned the crank, and swiftly a succession of scenes flashed over the dial. On this little patch of glassite, Kay was actually making the spatial journey to Albany, each minutest movement of the crank representing a distance covered. The building of the New York Division appeared, and its appearance signified that Kay was telephonically connected. But there was no automatic voice attachment, an expense that Kay and Cliff had decided would be unjustified. He had to rely upon the old-fashioned telephone, such as was still widely in use in rural districts. He took up the receiver. "'Substation F. Loyalist registration, please,' he called. "'Speaking,' said a girl's voice presently. "'I want the Z numbers, all from Z5 to ZA,' said K. And thus, in the dark hut, he listened to the doom pronounced miles away by a more or less indifferent operator. When the fatal number was read out, he thanked her and hung up. He released the crank, which moved back to its position, putting out the light on the dial. For a moment or two he stood there, motionless, in a sort of daze, though actually he was gathering all his resources of resolution for the task confronting him. Simply to find Ruth among the hundred thousand victims and die with her, a task stupendous in itself, and yet Kay had no doubt that he would succeed, that he would be holding her in his arms when the tide of hell flowed over them. He knew the manner of that death, the irresistible onset of the giant masses of protoplasm, the extrusion of temporary arms or feelers that would grasp them, drag them into the heart of the yielding substance, and slowly smother them to death while the life was drained from their bodies. It had been said that death was painless, but that was government propaganda. But he would be holding Ruth in his arms. He'd find her. He had no doubt of that at all. And, strangely enough, now that Kay knew the worst, now that not the slightest doubt remained, he was conscious of an elevation of spirits, a sort of mad recklessness that was perfectly indefinable. Kay turned his torch into a corner of the kitchen. Yes, there was the thing subconsciousness had prompted him to seek, a long-shafted heavy woodsman's axe, a formidable weapon at close quarters. Because it is the instinct of Homo Americanus to die with a weapon in his hands rather than let himself be butchered helplessly. Kay snatched it up. He ran back to his plane. The gas tank was nearly empty, but there was petrol in the ice house beside the lake. Kay wheeled the machine up to it and filled up with gas and oil. All ready now. He leaped in, pressed the starter, soared vertically, helicopter wings fluttering like a soaring hawk's up to the passenger air lane at 9,000, higher to 12, the track of the international and supply ships, higher still to the 14,000 ceiling of the antiquated machine. He banked, turned southward. It was freezing cold up there, and Kay had no flying suit on him, but between the passenger lane and the lane of the heliospheres at 30,000, there was no air police, and he could afford to take no chances. The government police would be on the lookout for a score such desperate men as he, bent on a similar mission. He drove the plane toward the Atlantic, till a red glow began to diffuse itself beneath him, an area of conflagration covering square miles of territory. Swooping lower, Kay could hear the sound of detonations, the roar of old-fashioned guns, while through the pall of lurid smoke came the long violet flashes of atomic guns, cleaving lanes of devastation. 
New York was burning. The frenzied populace had broken into revolt, seized the guns stored in the arsenals, and attacked the great Bronx fortress that stood like a mighty sentinel to protect the port. A swarm of airships came into view, swirling in a savage fight. Kay zoomed. It was not his battle. Now New York lay behind him, and he was winging southward over the Atlantic. All night he flew. At dawn he came down in a coast hamlet for bootleg petrol and oil. "'Y'all come from New York?' asked the Georgian. "'Here there's war broke out up there.' "'My war's down in Brazil,' muttered Kay. "'Say, if them giants comes up here, you know what us folks is going to do? <laughs> "'We're going to set the hounds on them. "'Yes, sir, we got a pack of bloodhounds raised for just that purpose. "'I guess that's something them wisecrackers at Washington ain't thought of. <laughs> "'They took two little fellers from Hopetown, "'but they won't take nobody from here.' Kay fueled up and resumed his flight southward. After that it was a nightmare. The sun rose and set, alternating with the staring moon and stars. Kay crossed the Caribbean, sighted the South American coast, swept southward over the jungles of Brazil. He drank, but no food passed his lips. He had become a mechanism, set for on a special purpose, self-immolation. It was in a wide savanna among the jungles that he first caught sight of the monsters. At first he thought it was the rising dawn mist. Then he began to distinguish a certain horrible resemblance to human forms, and swooped down, banking round and round the opening in the jungle until he could see clearly. There were perhaps a score of them, an advance guard that had pushed forward from one of the main divisions. Men? Anthropoids, rather, for their sex was indistinguishable. Human forms ranged from a few feet to a hundred, composed apparently of a grayish jelly, propelling themselves clumsily on two feet, but floating rather than walking, translucent, semi-transparent. Most horrible of all, these shadowy spheroid creatures exhibited here and there buds of various sizes, which were taking on the similitude of fresh forms and among them were the young, the buds that had fallen from the parent stems, fully formed humans of perhaps five or six feet, bouncing with a horrible playfulness among their sires. As Kay soared some three hundred feet overhead, a young taper came leaping out of the jungle and ran, apparently unconscious of their presence, right toward the monsters. Suddenly it stopped and Kay saw that it was already encircled by coils of protoplasm resembling arms which had shot forth from the bodies of the devils. Swiftly, despite its struggles and bleatings, the tapir was drawn into the substance of the monsters, which seemed to fuse together and form a solid wall of protoplasm in all respects like the agglutination of bacteria under certain conditions. Then the beast vanished in the wall whose agitated churnings alone gave proof of its existence. For perhaps ten minutes longer Kay remained hovering over the clearing. Then the bodies divided, resumed their separate shapes, and the white bones of the tepir lay in a huddled mass in the open. Kay went mad. Deliberately he set down his plane, and, hatchet in hand, advanced upon the sluggish monsters. Shouting wildly, he leaped into their midst. The fight that followed was like a nightmare fight. He lopped off the slow tentacles that sought to envelop him. He slashed the devils into long ribbons of writhing jelly, slashed until their substance blunted the axe, wiped it clean, and leaped into their midst again, hewing until he could no longer raise his arm. Then he drew back and surveyed the scene before him. It was dreadful enough to drive the last remnants of sanity from his brain. For every piece that he had cut from the monsters, every protoplasmic ribbon was reorganizing before his eyes into the semblance of a new creature. Where there had been a score, there were now five hundred. 
Kay ran back to his plane, leaped in and soared southward. His face was a grotesque mask of madness, and his cries rang out through the ether. The victims were no longer chained to stakes. The Federation, which always acted with complete secrecy, had gone one better. It had engaged electrical engineers, kept them housed in secret places, transported them to Golgotha, and there a vast electrified field had been established, an open space whose boundaries were marked out by pillars of electron steel. Between these pillars ran lines of electric force. To attempt to pass them meant not death, for dead boys and girls were spurned by the devils, but a violent shock that hurled one backward. On this great plain the hundred thousand victims sat huddled in the open. Food they had none, for no purpose was to be served by mitigating their last agonies. No shelter either, for the sight of buildings might delay the final phase. But high above the doomed there floated the flag of the Federation, on a lofty pole, a touch of ironic sentimentality that had commended itself to some mind at Washington. Over a square mile of territory ringed with jungle the victims lay. The majority of them ringed this terrain, that is to say, attempting to escape, they had been hurled back by the electrical charge, and having no strength or will remaining, they had dropped where they had been hurled, and lay in apathetic resignation. There had been screams and cries for mercy and piteous scenes when the government airships had deposited them there and flown away, but now an intense silence had descended upon the doomed, Resigned to their fate, they sat or lay in little silent groups, all eyes turned toward the gloomy jungle. And everywhere within this jungle a wraith-like mist was forming at this dawn hour. From a thousand miles around the devils were mustering for their prey, agglutinating in order that the meal of one might become the meal of all. Wisps of protoplasmic fog were stealing out through the trees, changing shape every instant, but always advancing, now presenting the appearance of an aligned regiment of huge shadowy men, now nothing but a wall of semi-solid vapor, and still, with eyeballs straining in their sockets, the victims watched. Suddenly all were seized with the same spasm of mad terror. Again they hurled themselves against the electrified lines, and again they were hurled back, masses of boys and girls tumbling against one another, and screaming in one wail that, could it have been heard in Washington, would have driven all insane. Again and again till they fell back, panting and helpless. And solidly the wall of devils was creeping up from every side. Ruth Dean, one of the few who had themselves in control, lay some distance back from the electrified field. From the moment when she was surprised in her apartment by the government representatives, she had known that there was no hope of escape. She had slipped the ring off her finger, snapped the plastic metal, and attached it to a thread torn from her dress. She had uh, managed to insert it in the door, hoping that Kay would find it. It would serve as a last message of love to him. Every removal of a selected victim was in the nature of a kidnapping. At dead of night her apartment had been opened. She had been ordered to dress. Nothing could be written, no arrangements made. She was already considered as one dead. She had been hurried out of the upper entrance to the monorail, which conveyed her in a special car to the landing station. A few minutes later she had been on her way to join the camp of other victims a hundred miles away. Within two hours she was on her way southward. Stunned by the tragedy, none of the victims had made much of an outcry. They had been given water by the airship police. No food for boys and girls already dead. Days and nights had passed, and now she was here, faint from exhaustion and wondering at the despair shown by these others. What difference would it make in half an hour? Besides, that government pamphlet had insisted that this death was painless. But an immense longing to see Kay once more came over her. There had been a time when she thought she loved Cliff, 
Then Kay had come into her life, and she had known that other affair was folly. She had never told Kay of the bitter scene between Cliff and herself, how he had raved against Kay and sworn to win her in the end. Cliff had calmed down and apologized, and Ruth had never seen him again. She wished he had not taken it like that. But above all she wanted to see Kay, just to say good-bye. And she tried to send out her whole heart to him in an unspoken message of love that would surely somehow convey itself to him. The wall of devils was creeping up on every side, slowly, lethargically. The monsters took their time, because they knew they were invincible. The sobs and shrieks had died away. Collected into a mass almost as rigid as that of the earth giants, the victims waited, palsied as a rabbit that awaits the approach of the serpent. A humming overhead, an airplane shooting down from the sky. Rescue? No. Only a solitary pilot armed with a woodsman's axe. Kay drifted down, touched ground, leaped to his feet. Chance had brought him within five hundred yards of where Ruth was standing. But Ruth had known who that lone flyer must be. She broke through the throng, she rushed to meet him, her arms were around him. Kay, darling Kay. Ruth, dearest. I knew you'd come. I've come to die beside you. It was perhaps odd that it did not enter the head of either as a possibility that Kay should simply place Ruth in the plane and fly away with her to safety. Had the thought occurred to Kay, he might have been tempted. But such black treachery was something inconceivable by either. So long as the Federation remained, so long as man moved in an organized society, he was bound to his fellows to fight, suffer, and die with them. Stand by me, Ruth. We're going down fighting. They moved back toward the throng, which, momentarily stirred to hope by Kay's appearance, had fallen into the former apathy of despair. And now the monsters were beginning to enter the electrified zone at one point. As they passed the line of posts, the high-tension current made their bodies luminous, but it had no appreciable effect upon them. They moved on, inevitably. A score or so of semi-human forms agglutinated into a mass, and yet individually discernible. They bore down slowly upon the crowd of victims, who pressed backward as they advanced. On the other sides, though they almost encircled the field of death, the monsters were making no maneuvers to entrap their prey. Their sluggish minds were incapable of conceiving anything of the kind. But for the electrified zone, the great majority of the victims could have effected their escape. The monsters were simply pressing forward to their meal. They did not interpret its capture in terms of strategy at all. A new frenzy of horror seized the crowd. They fled, struggling back until the foremost in flight reached the other side of Golgotha, to be repulsed by the electrified zone there. They fell in tumbled heaps. Appalling shrieks rang through the air. Another line of the monsters was seeping forward, converging toward the first. As the two lines met, they coalesced into a wall of protoplasm, a thousand feet in length by a hundred high, a wall out of which leered phantasmal faces like those in a frieze. Kay stood alone, his arm around Ruth. To follow the flying mob would but prolong the agony. He raised the axe. He looked into the girl's eyes. She understood and nodded. One last embrace, one kiss, and Kay placed her behind him. He sprang forward, shouting, and plunged into the very heart of the wall. And Ruth, watching with eyes dilated with horror, saw it yield with a sucking sound, and saw Kay disappear within it. She saw the hideous mass fold itself upon him, and a hundred extruded tentacles wave in the air as they blindly grappled for him. And then Kay had broken through, and was hewing madly with great sweeps of the axe that slashed great streamers of the amorphous tissue from the wall of protoplasm. It recoiled and then folded once more, and Kay's mighty sweeps were slashing phantom limbs from phantom bodies, and lopping off tentacles that curled and coiled, and put forth caricatures of hands and fingers, and then, uniting with other slashed-off tentacles, began to mold themselves into the likeness of dwarf monsters. 
Kay's struggle was like that of a man fighting a fog, for again and again he broke through the wall, and always it reunited and behind it another wall of protoplasm was pressing forward, and on another side a wall was drifting up. As Kay stopped, panting and momentarily free, Ruth saw that they were almost encircled. She saw the nature of that fight. Inevitably the wall would close about them, and though the bones of last year's victims had been gathered up and carried away by the Federation, she guessed what would occur. She ran to Kay and dragged him back through the closing gap. It met behind them, and again they stood face to face with the devils. Only this time, instead of a wall of protoplasm, it was a veritable mountain that confronted them, and there could be no more breaking through. Kay thought afterward that the one touch of absolute horror was that the reforming monsters, the young ones growing visibly before his eyes, had the gambling instinct of young lambs or other creatures. They were much more lively than the parent creatures. By this time perhaps a third of the space within the electrified lines had been occupied by the devils. The wall was slowly and sluggishly advancing, and a fresh infiltration was drifting in on another side. As the victims were pressed closer and closer together in their flight, half of them seemed to go insane. They raced to and fro, laughing and screaming, flinging their arms aloft in extravagant gestures. One young fellow, rushing across the ground, hurled himself like a bolt from a catapult into the heart of the grisly mass, which opened and received him. There was a struggle, a convulsion. Then the mass moved on. Kay wiped his axe. He stood beside Ruth, gathering strength and breath to fight again. What else was there to do? Suddenly a humming sound came to his ears. Still some little distance from the monsters, he glanced back. The victims were shouting, staring upward. Over the tops of the jungle trees, Kay saw a second airplane flying toward them, a larger one than the plane which he had flown. It opened its helicopter wings and drifted downward. Kay saw a single pilot, and in the baggage compartment something that at first he did not recognize. Then he recognized both this object and the aviator. "'It's Cliff!' he whispered hoarsely. "'He's brought the top!' The crowd was milling about Cliff as he stepped out of the plane. Kay broke through their midst, shouting to them to clear a space, that it was their chance, their only chance. They heard him and obeyed, and Cliff and Kay clasped hands, and there was Ruth beside them. The two men carried the top out of the baggage compartment and set it up. "'Thank God I came in time!' Cliff hissed. "'How long have we got, Kay?' Five minutes, I think,' Kay answered, glancing at the oncoming wall. "'They're slow. "'Will it work, Cliff? "'God, when I found you'd gone last night!' Cliff did not answer. Ignoring Kay's offer of assistance, he fitted the top tightly into its socket of craolite, much heavier than the former one. Beneath this, three heavy craolite legs formed a sort of tripod. "'I looked forward to this possibility, Kay,' said Cliff, as he adjusted the top and turned the clamps that held it in position. "'Sorry I had to deceive you. But <laughs> you were so set on the cosmic rays, and I knew the psenium emanations wouldn't appeal to you. You wouldn't have believed. I had a hunch Ruth would draw one of those numbers. How long?' The swaying masses of grey jelly were very near them. Cliff worked feverishly at the top. "'Let me help, Cliff!' "'No, I'm through. Stand back!' shouted Cliff. Even then, he regretted it afterward, and knew that he would regret it to his dying day. Even then the thought flashed through Kay's mind that Cliff wanted all the glory. Behind him the milling, screaming crowd was huddling, as if for protection. Slowly a wisp-like tentacle protruded from the advancing wall. Kay swung his axe and lopped it from the phantom body. But the wall was almost upon them, and from the other side it was advancing rapidly. "'I'm ready. Stand back!' Cliff turned upon Kay, his face white, his voice hoarse. I, I, "'One request to make, Kay. Keep everybody back, including you and Ruth. Nobody is to come within twenty-five yards of this machine.' "'That shall be done,' said Kay, a, a little bitterness in his tone. "'Ruth, I think I'm going to save you all.' 
Cliff looked into the girl's face for a moment. "'Please stand back twenty-five yards,' he repeated. Kay took Ruth by the arm and drew her back. The crowd moved back, their pressure moving back, the vast multitudes behind them. The vast mob was almost packed into the quarter of the Golgotha. There was scarcely room to move. Kay saw Cliff press the lever. Slowly the giant top began to whirl. Faster, faster, now it was revolving so fast that it had become totally invisible. Now Cliff was almost surrounded by the wall of jelly, only his back could be seen, and then space was narrowing fast. Kay gripped Ruth's arm tightly. He held his breath. The crowd, of whom only a small part knew what was taking place, was screaming with terror as the mass of jelly on the other side pressed them inexorably backward. And Cliff had almost vanished. Would the machine work? Was it possible that the senium emanations would succeed where the Millican rays, the W ray, had failed? Then of a sudden the air grew dark as night. Kay began to sneeze. He gasped for air. He was choking. He could see nothing. And he strained Ruth to him convulsively, while the terrified multitudes behind him set up a last wail of despair. He could see nothing. And he stood with the axe ready for the onset of the monsters, more terrible now in their invisibility than before. Then, of a sudden, there sounded subterranean rumblings. The ground seemed to open almost under Kay's feet. He leaped back, dragging Ruth with him. Slowly the dust was settling, the darkness lessening. A faint, luminous glow overhead revealed the sun. Kay was aware that Cliff had swung the top, so that the senium rays were being brought to bear upon the second mass of the monsters on the other side. The sun vanished in appalling blackness. Again the dust-choked air was almost unbreathable. The shrieks of the crowd died away in wheezing gasps, and then a wilder clamor began. The earthquake! The earthquake! A girl was shrilling. God, help us all! Kay stood still, clutching Ruth tightly in his arms. He dared not stir, for all the world seemed to be dissolving into chaos. Slowly the dust began to settle again. Perhaps five minutes passed before the sunbeams began to struggle through. A cloud of gray dust still obscured everything. But the wall of protoplasm was gone! Cliff's voice came moaning out of the murk, calling Kay's name. Kay moved forward cautiously, still holding Ruth. He seemed to be skirting the edge of a vast crater. At the edge of it he found the top revolving slowly and Cliff's voice came from beside the top. Kay, we've won. Don't, lo don't look at me. Don't let Ruth see me. Look down. Kay looked down into the bottomless pit, extending clear across the plain to the distant jungle, an enormous canyon cloven in the earth, filled with the slowly settling cloud of dust. They're there, Kay. Don't look this way. But Kay looked, and could see nothing except a pile of debris from the bottom of which Cliff's voice issued. Cliff, you're not hurt. Uh, a little. You must listen while I tell you how to clean up the monsters. It's the senium emanation. It has the same effect when our method is applied to it. It disintegrates everything inorganic, not organic. I thought if I couldn't get them... I'd crumble the earth away, bury them. They're underneath the debris, Kay, a mile deep buried, beneath the impalpable powder that represented the inorganic salts and minerals of the earth. They'll never get out of that. Protoplasm needs oxygen. They'll trouble us no more. You must take the top, Kay. Use our old method. You'll find its application to the senium emanation within a, a book fastened beneath the hood. Wipe out the rest of them. If any more come, you'll know how to deal with them. Cliff, you're, you're not badly hurt, Kay asked again. Don't, don't look. I tell you, keep Ruth away. But the dust was settling fast, and suddenly Ruth uttered a scream of fear and a strangled cry broke from Kay's throat as he looked down at what had been Cliff Hines. The man seemed to have become resolved into the same sort of protoplasm as the earth giants. 
He lay, a little heap, incredibly small, incredibly distorted, flesh without bones, shapeless lumps of flesh where arms and legs and body frame should have been. Cliff's voice came faintly. You remember the leakage through the rubber and an electron container, okay? The, the W rays even fused the craylite socket. The cenium rays are stronger. They destroy even bone. They're fatal to the man who operates the machine, unless he follows the directions. I've written them out for you, but I had no time to apply them. His voice broke off. Then, good luck to you and Ruth K. He whispered almost inaudibly. Don't let her look at me. Kay led Ruth gently away. Did you hear that? She whispered, sobbing. He died to save us, Kay. It was like a return from the grave for the amazed boys and girls who, since the outset of the monsters had destroyed the electric lines, poured out of the plain of Golgotha to life and freedom. Many of them had gone mad. A few had died of fright, but the rest would come back to normal, and the world was saved. Hunger was their greatest problem, for despite Kay's hurried flight to the nearest occupied post, it was difficult to convince the Federation officials that the devils were really gone, buried beneath a mile of crumbled earth, and Kay had to be back to mop up other smaller bands that had spread through the forests. It was six months before the last of the monsters had been obliterated, and then Kay, now one of the highest officials in the Federation service, was granted a Lunarian's leave of absence pending his taking command of an Antarctic expedition for the purpose of destroying the remaining monsters in their lair. He took the opportunity to be married to Ruth in the church of his native town, which was en fête for the occasion. Thinking of Cliff... Kay asked his bride as she settled in his plane, preparatory to their starting for the honeymoon in the Adirondacks. I think he would be happy if he knew. He saved the world, dear. He gave his best. And that was all he wanted. End of The Wall of Death by Victor Rousseau